Hello class, this is Miss Augustine, and we are still in chapters 17 and 18. That is water and aqueous solutions. This is part two, and we're going to talk about the solution process. So first of all, what things affect the rate of dissolution, which is what things affect how something dissolves? So increasing the surface area of the solute um, helps. So which dissolves faster, a sugar cube or granulated sugar? Granulated sugar because there's more surface area to contact the solvent. How about agitation? That means stirring. So does stirring help dissolve sugar? Absolutely. And how about heating a solvent? So if you're trying to put, for instance, sugar in your iced tea, it doesn't always dissolve well. So sometimes when I make um, iced tea, I start with hot tea, I put my sugar in it because in the hot solvent, it's going to have more motion of the particles, and it's going to dissolve faster, and then I'll cool it down. The other thing we like to talk about is solution equilibrium. So in this case, I have sodium chloride in a little container of water. And if you put a whole lot of table salt in, it's not going to all dissolve. Some's going to fall to the bottom. And so what you get is actually a process where some is dissolving and some is crystallizing. So I'm going to show you what that looks like with a FET that I have. So this is a FET simulator, and I have table salt, which is sodium chloride. And over here, it shows you sodium are the pink ones, chlorides are the green ones. So I'm just going to shake in some sodium chloride. And initially, they are all dissolving. But if I keep putting it in, what happens is, at some point, I'm going to reach the end of the solubility. And so what will be happening here, if you look, you can see that some are depositing back out again and some are dissolving again. So this would be an example of this solution equilibrium. When you're at the limits of solubility, some is going to precipitate or crystallize out and some is going to dissolve. And I wanted to show you a slightly soluble salt. This one is strontium phosphate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shake some in. Shake, 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 shake. And initially it's going to dissolve. But you're going to see now, again, as you're watching this, you're going to see some of them are falling out and forming crystals. And some of them are dissolving again. So this is what is meant by a solution equilibrium. And when you've reached this point, this would be what we would call a saturated solution. So if you buy a saturated solution, there will always be a little pile of salt or solute at the bottom of the bottle. And that's telling you that this is the absolute maximum amount that can dissolve. And so what happens is some will be going back into solution, some will be dropping back out. And I picked this strontium phosphate because it's kind of cool. It forms these little uh, six-membered rings, uh, the crystal shape. So that was our little FET simulation of what's going on in solution. So now I want to talk a little bit about the solubility and definition of solubility and uh, solubility curves that we look at to figure out how soluble something is. So we have to think about solute, the thing that's being dissolved, and solvent interactions. So why does salt dissolve in water but iodine doesn't? Why does oil uh, not mix in water. Why does iodine dissolve in alcohol, but salt doesn't? All of these have to do with whether the solute and the solvent are attracted to one another and whether they're going to be able to be attracted enough to pull something into solution. So the rule of thumb is that like dissolves like. So will something dissolve in water or not? Because water is polar, Things that are also polar will dissolve in it because like dissolves like, polar dissolves polar, and nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. So if I was trying to dissolve a piece of wax, for instance, I would have to pick a nonpolar solvent like carbon tetrachloride. If I'm trying to dissolve sodium chloride, which is polar, I would pick a polar.
polar solvent. So water is polar, so only polar substances will dissolve well in it. And again, salt is polar, so it dissolves readily in water. Oil is nonpolar, so it floats on water because it's less dense and does not combine with it. And that's what's going on with your oil and vinegar salad dressing, for instance. So the polarity of water is something that we like to talk about. And again, water has this slightly negative region where oxygen is and slight, slightly positive region where the hydrogens are. And that has to do with the fact that oxygen is much more electronegative than hydrogen. That means that the electrons are staying closer to the oxygen. Electrons are negative and they're not staying near the hydrogen. That makes the hydrogens positive. So this is showing you again what was going on in that little FET simulation, that the waters are going to be pulling in the sodium chloride, and that you'll see around the negative chloride, the waters are aligned with the hydrogen portion, which is positive around it. And the sodiums, again, because they're positive, the waters are aligned with the negative end around them. So this is something called the solubility curve. And this is if I was trying to dissolve some potassium nitrate in water and I wanted to know how much would dissolve at room temperature, which is about 25 degrees, I could look on here and say, oh, I can dissolve about 40 grams of potassium nitrate in water that's at 25 degrees C. Solubility is um, expressed or defined as the amount of a given solute that can dissolve in a given amount of water. In this example, it's in 100 grams of water, and that is at a specific temperature. So if we look, for instance, at potassium chloride, the blue line, at zero degrees C, you can get about 26 grams of potassium chloride in 100 grams of water, 100 mils of water. But if you heat that water up to 100 degrees, now you can dissolve about 58 grams. Some are much more pronounced than that. If we look at potassium nitrate, at zero, you can only get in about 12 grams of potassium nitrate. But if you heat that water up to uh, 50 degrees, now you can get 90 grams of potassium nitrate in that same amount of water. So this is showing you that solubility of most things increases with um, the increase in temperature. Here, our cerium um, sulfate, however, does not. The, it decreases in solubility as the temperature increases. So the solubility curve is showing me a saturated solution, the maximum amount of a solute that I can dissolve in a specific amount of water at that temperature. And so that's anywhere along the line. So let's just go back for a second. So the maximum amount that I can put at any given temperature is this line. If I am below that line, so let's say I only wanted to put in 30 grams of potassium nitrate at 30 degrees C, that means it is unsaturated. It's well below the maximum that I could put in. So unsaturated is less than the maximum amount of a solute that you can dissolve at a specific uh, temperature in a given amount of solvent. So again, anywhere below the line. And then finally, a supersaturated solution has more than the maximum amount of solute dissolved in a specific amount of solvent. And in order to do that, you have to trick it by increasing the temperature. And that means it's above the line. And that's how you make, for instance, a um, rock candy. So how does that work? So what you would do is if I want to make a um, sugar solution that is super saturated, and that's what simple syrup is, I'll dissolve two cups of sugar in a half a cup of water. And in order to get it to, to, to I can speak, to dissolve, I have to heat it up almost to boiling. So now I have a super saturated solution of water and sugar. And if I cool it down gently to room temperature, it's super saturated. So let me go back and show you what that looks like on the graph. So here, I don't have um, sugar on this chart, but let's say I dissolved um, here. 
let's say I dissolve 95 grams of lead to nitrate in water and I heated it up to 60 degrees to do that. Now I'm going to cool it down. And as I cool it down to say room temperature, which is around here, I now have 95 grams in, which is well above the line. That is what we call a supersaturated solution. So um, again, I just wanted to um, go back to this slide and show you that when you've created a supersaturated solution, which we have here, if you leave it to sit, it will eventually recrystallize. And when you're making rock candy, what you do is you actually hang a string um, or a stick into your supersaturated solution and the crystals will slowly form. So why would you want to make a supersaturated solution outside of making rock candy? Well, a reason would be, let's say I made something in the lab and I collected crystals. The crystals that I collect may not be pure. Um, so for instance, when they um, mine salt, for instance, from the salt mines, um, they have to recrystallize it many times. The same goes for sugar. And so they take advantage of this supersaturated solution. They dissolve up the dirty crystals in water they form a supersaturated solution and then they cool it and they collect those crystals. So anything that you buy as a powder, whether it be um, sugar or salt or medications that are uh, put into your pills, whatever, all of those have gone through many recrystallizations using this supersaturated solution concept. And then they're collected and rinsed and then recrystallized again so that they are food grade, for instance, which means um, clean enough for consumption. So I'm going to leave you off with the thought that the definition of solubility is the maximum amount of a solute that can be dissolved in a specific amount of a solvent at a specific temperature. So for today, this is Ms. Augustine signing off.